Welcome to our program, The Freedom Agenda and America's Future, featuring Vice President Mike Pence. Please welcome the President of the Heritage Foundation, Dr. Kevin Roberts. Welcome to our program, The Freedom Agenda and America's Future, featuring Vice President Mike Pence. Please welcome the President of the Heritage Foundation, Dr. Kevin Roberts. We wanted to make sure you're awake, which is why we did that twice. <laughs> Thanks for being here. It is great to see a full auditorium and then some at the Heritage Foundation, especially for our friend, Vice President Mike Pence. And we know that thousands, if not tens of thousands of people are tuning in and will be tuning in. So thanks for being here. It's a great day to be alive in America, in spite of the fact that we know that there are a lot of challenges here. And we know that there are a lot of commentaries right now about the midterm elections, as there should be. Elections and campaigns are important. But you know that the lane that the Heritage Foundation occupies and in fact, the lane that we specialize in is policy. And so today, from our friend, we're going to hear a lot about policy. And at the conclusion of his remarks, he and I will have a conversation that focuses on that. And we'll be talking about the consequences of elections. It's not enough as American conservatives merely to win elections. Here at Heritage, we know what time it is in America. And the time that it is, is the time to reclaim this country with smiles in our faces, with a commitment, and with courage to govern as conservatives. And in my time, now as a policy leader, before as an education leader, when I thought about people in Washington, D.C., who personified that commitment, at the top of the list always was Mike Pence. And so here at Heritage, where the vice president, after his service as vice president, served for more than a year as a distinguished senior fellow. He's a longtime friend. Please join me in welcoming Vice President Mike Pence. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for that overly generous introduction, and more importantly, thank you for your extraordinary leadership of the Heritage Foundation. We are all grateful for the way you have stepped into this role and led the flagship of the conservative movement to even greater heights. Join me in thanking Dr. Kevin Roberts briefly. Now, Dr. Roberts and I have known each other a long time. We actually we actually both started out in the state policy movement. He knows the introduction I prefer is a little bit shorter. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order, and it's my great honor to be here to talk about an agenda for the conservative movement for the future. 
Well, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today. I, uh, I'm honored to be with you all. We gather at a very serious time in the life of our nation. Today, American freedom is under attack. Big media, big government, big tech, and even big business have locked arms to advance an agenda antithetical to some of the greatest traditions of this country of freedom and values. Twenty years ago, when I first arrived in Washington, D.C., I never thought I'd live to see a day when the leadership in our nation's capital was more out of touch with the common sense and common values of the American people. But we live in such a time. Liberal policies have created one disaster after another in the history of this nation, but none more so than in the last two years. As we stand here today under President Joe Biden and the leadership of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, we have the worst border crisis in our nation's history. Our currency has been debased with inflation at a 40-year high. A war on energy has launched a, a crisis at the gasoline pump and a man-made energy crisis in America. Our schools have been transformed into indoctrination centers and the strength of our nation on the world stage has been cashiered and diminished through a waning commitment to our national defense and through the feckless leadership of this president. But as we gather here today at Heritage Foundation, I'm proud to report, having traveled to more than 32 states over the last 12 months, Help is on the way. We are 20 days away from the beginning of a great American comeback. I truly do believe it. I think in 20 days, the American people are going to rise up. Having gotten a full dose of the politics of the American left, unvarnished, and seeing the outcome of a weaker America at home and abroad, I truly do believe 20 days from now, in big cities and small towns all across this country, the American people are going to grab the reins back. I believe when all the dust settles, we will have a majority in the House, we will have a majority in the Senate, and we will elect a record number of conservative governors all across America. So get ready. That being said, there's no time like the present to talk about the future. You know, I originally planned to be here at Heritage Foundation back in July, but uh, nature had different plans. I appreciate many of you for rescheduling this delayed presentation. But maybe it's what we call at my house God's timing. Because now more than ever, we ought to be thinking not just about Election Day, but about the day after Election Day and what the agenda will be for really bringing America back, which you and I all know is going to be by returning America to the principles of the American founding, by returning this nation to the time-honored traditions and values and ideals that created unprecedented prosperity in the freest and most prosperous nation in the history of the world. And I want to speak about that today. But before I do, let me pay a debt of gratitude and honor to the Heritage Foundation. You know, Heritage Foundation, for me, anytime I come, always feels a little bit like a homecoming. I first ran for Congress back when Ronald Reagan was in the White House. I lost. Twice. But I had an opportunity to learn about a place called the Heritage Foundation. And I went back to Indiana after those losses, and I, I started a state policy group that was inspired by the Heritage Foundation. And all through my years in the Congress, my years as governor of Indiana, I must tell you that the men and women here at the Heritage Foundation, this extraordinary and courageous organization fueled so much of what we conservatives were able to do in the first decade of this century, in my time in Indiana. And I'm incredibly proud to say that under the Trump-Pence administration, we implemented nearly two-thirds of Heritage Foundation's policy 
recommendations. No administration in history had ever adopted heritage policy recommendations faster than ours. And it's because freedom works. But credit where credit is due, as I said, I'm grateful to Dr. Kevin Roberts. I was honored to be a distinguished visiting fellow here at Heritage during my return to private citizenship. But I'm also grateful to his predecessor, my friend Kay Cole James, for her stewardship here and the matchless leadership and visionary leadership of Dr. Ed Fulmer, who I consider both a mentor and a friend. Before I press on to my topic of the day, allow me also Allow me also to express my deep admiration for the life and the work and the leadership of a man who left us just a few short weeks ago. Phil Truluck was here for nearly four decades at the Heritage Foundation. He served in executive positions. He brought together many of the extraordinary talents that are gathered in this room today and inspired many of the policies that are still celebrated and associated with Heritage Foundation rightly. He was also a truly good man. Well, I remember when I got through a few tight spots in my career, it seemed like it was Phil Truluck. Came alongside and just said, hang in there, Mike. So to his wife, Ann, to all who loved and admired this good man, this principled conservative, we honor the memory of the late Phil Truluck, and we are grateful for his leadership. <laughs> You know, the conservative movement has always been built on the notion that ideas have consequences. Conservatism is bigger than any one moment, any one election, any one person. It's about ideas. And for nearly half a century, Heritage Foundation has been the conservative movement's idea factory. From the Reagan Revolution, the mandate for leadership, inspired the contract for America, and I can tell you, was right there shoulder to shoulder with us throughout our efforts to make America great again. In the four years of the Trump-Pence administration, Heritage Foundation made a difference. And so with a great conservative victory just within our reach, I thought it was altogether fitting to come here to the Heritage Foundation and really describe an agenda that I believe will not just lay a foundation for success for our movement or for our party, but more importantly, will lay a foundation of strength and prosperity for millions of Americans. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, where there is no vision, the people perish. And what's true of a people is also true of a movement. And so I truly do believe it's absolutely essential that we, we articulate a vision for the path ahead, a vision that's grounded in our highest ideals and grounded in the, grounded in the proven principles that Heritage Foundation has been about all along. And make no mistake about it, oftentimes with victory uh, comes flexibility. I can't help but think of those days when I arrived in 2001 in Washington, D.C. We had won back the Congress, House, and the Senate. We elected a Republican president in the year 2000 from the state of Texas, a man that I deeply admire. But he brought with him uh, the idea of what he came to be known as compassionate conservatism. But I remember as a feisty new freshman in Congress in 2001 saying, compassionate conservatism sounds a whole lot like big government republicanism. <laughs> and the battles that would ensue, battles that I wrote about in my forthcoming book, were rear guard actions by conservatives that were literally battling against members of our own party, a White House of our own party that was looking to grow government, grow entitlements, expand the federal government's role in our local schools. And so I come to you today with a, a, a life of experience that says that now, more than ever, we need to decide who we are and who we will be. Because victory is at hand, men and women. But when victory comes, we need to make sure and reground ourselves. But there's a healthy debate going on within our movement today. It's uh, the path ahead is not really clearly defined. Some in our movement long for a simple return to traditional conservative agenda of the Reagan era. Others say our movement should be swept along by a new and energetic sense of populism. 
I truly do believe that we don't have to choose between one at the expense of another. After all, I believe the agenda of the Trump-Pence administration was a marriage of an unapologetic commitment to the foundations of the conservative agenda with thoughtful populist priorities driven by the aspirations of the American people. I'm proud to report during the four years of our administration, every single day, we fought for a strong national defense, for free market and free enterprise principles, less government, less taxes, less regulation, and we stood every day for the sanctity of human life. But in our administration, we also, we also heeded the call of the American people. We recognize that border security is national security. We recognize that trade must be free and fair. And we changed the national consensus. But now today in America, the vast majority of the people of this country accept that China is the greatest threat to our security and prosperity in the 21st century. So today on the cusp of a new era of Republican leadership for conservatives in this moment in history, I think we need to, we need to chart a course that, that doesn't veer off too far in either direction. Our movement cannot forsake the foundational commitment that we have to security, to limited government, to liberty, and to life. But nor can we allow our movement to be led astray by the siren song of unprincipled populism that's unmoored from our oldest traditions and most cherished values. Let me say, this movement and the party that it animates must remain the movement of a strong national defense, limited government, and traditional moral values and life. So in 2022, conservatives have a, maybe a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to save America from decline and decay, to mint a true governing majority that could last for generations. But in order to win, I believe, as Heritage Foundation believes, that we must do more than simply criticize and complain. We must unite around a bold and optimistic agenda. And that was how the Freedom Agenda was born. After I left office, we pulled together a number of former cabinet officials and, frankly, leaders here at Heritage Foundation, including Ed Fulner, Ed Meese, and Jessica Anderson, who just does a matchless job at Heritage Action all across America. You can give her a round of applause if you agree with me. But I, I asked the members, former members of our administration, activists in the movement, I said, answer one question for me. And that is, what have been the ideas that have animated this movement from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump? And let's put it all in one place. And that was where the Freedom Agenda was born. We defined the Freedom Agenda into three parts, American culture, American opportunity, and American leadership. And for those of you following at home, you can go to advancingamericanfreedom.com and read along. We begin with preserving American culture. Andrew Breitbart, who was my friend before his untimely passing, said famously, politics is downstream of culture. And if we allow the radical left to continue dumping toxic waste into the headwaters of our culture, our politics will only get more poisonous over time. The culture we seek to preserve is the culture that's been handed down by generations of Americans who fought for it, defended it, and strengthened it in their time. And at the very core of it is that timeless American principle and belief that we are endowed, each of us, regardless of race or creed or color, by our Creator with certain unalienable rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So for me, it all begins with life, and the Freedom Agenda starts right there. To restore American culture 
We must restore the sanctity of life to the center of American law in every state in the country. Now, it's humbling for me to think that, uh, that thanks to three Supreme Court justices that were confirmed during our administration, Supreme Court of the United States this June sent Roe v. Wade to the ash heap of history where it belongs. The court gave the American people a new beginning for life, but make no mistake about it, it is only a beginning. The battle for life is far from over. In fact, we've probably just reached the end of the beginning. You know, yesterday President Biden actually pledged that if Democrat majorities were reelected in the House and in the Senate, he would use the anniversary of Roe v. Wade in January to codify that infamous decision into law. Well, I've got a newsflash for Joe Biden. On January 22nd, 2023, we're going to have pro-life majorities in the House and the Senate and we're going to be taking the case for life to every state in America. So I say to my fellow conservatives, now is not the time to shrink from the battle, but to lean into the fight for life with compassion and principle. For I truly do believe that many more are with us than are with them. This is a nation that cherishes life. And I believe if we hold the banner of life high, the American people will rally to our cause. Our agenda also calls, of course, for securing our border, protecting our communities, and standing unapologetically with the men and women who serve on the thin blue line of law enforcement. We call for defending the Second Amendment right of the American people, defending religious liberty and the freedom of speech. And when it comes to our schools, the Freedom Agenda recognizes that critical race theory is nothing more than state-sponsored racism, and it should be banned from every school in every state in the land. You know, Joe Biden, in his uh, last State of the Union address, actually pledged to defend the God-given right of men to compete in women's sports. Well, we need to end the assault on women's sports being driven by the radical left and preserve opportunities for our daughters and our granddaughters for generations to come. And on education, the antidote is universal school choice. I must tell you, I, uh, I come from a state that was home to the very first private educational voucher program in America, sponsored by the late J. Patrick Rooney, a great friend and patron of the Heritage Foundation. And in the Midwest, we were proud of our record on school choice. I doubled the size of our voucher program when I was governor. But states like Florida and Wisconsin, all across this country, moved the ball forward. But no state has done more than what Arizona just did when it became, thanks to Governor Doug Ducey's tenacity, the first state in America to extend universal school choice to every student in Arizona, regardless of their area code or income. And it's an incredible accomplishment. You know, there's much talk in our party and our movement about education. There are people that celebrate our possibility of being known as the parent party. And I celebrate that at the state level. When I first came to Congress, I remember the first bill the president handed us was called No Child Left Behind. It was the largest expansion of the Federal Department of Education since it was founded by Jimmy Carter. So my word to our fellow conservatives is let's, let's stand for education freedom. Let's empower parents. Let's make sure we advance patriotic education. But let's recognize that education is a state and local function and purpose ourselves to end the federal government's role in education and take every federal dollar and send it back to the states to expand choice and innovation. Next on the freedom agenda is, of course, restoring this economy. 
As I talk to media around the country, they often say there's always a new issue. Seems like every day they think it's going to drive the midterm elections. I tell them they're wrong. Everywhere I go, it's about inflation and gasoline prices and crime in the border. This 40-year high inflation is crushing American families. I talked at a gas station to a young mother in Hobart, Indiana, not long ago, who said literally that the rising price of gasoline at the pump, driven by Joe Biden's war on energy, has caused their family to have to go to a food bank twice a week just to have enough food to put on the table. Well, we know how to restore American prosperity. Under the Trump-Pence administration, we cut taxes, rolled back regulation. We unleashed American energy, and in three short years, 7 million good-paying jobs. Unemployment plummeted to a 50-year low, and the unemployment rate for African Americans and Hispanic Americans was the lowest ever recorded. And we can do it all again by embracing the policies of our administration, extending the Trump-Pence tax cuts, having more reciprocal trade deals in the world, and unleashing American energy. And finally, our culture will be renewed with our opportunity restored. America will once again be in a position to lead on the world stage. You know, I'm old enough to remember that Heritage Foundation was actually founded as a defense policy think tank. It was a time in the 1970s when then as now, Washington, D.C. was walking away from the first priority of the Constitution of the United States to provide for the common defense. And the Heritage Foundation and a handful of staffers came together and produced policies that recommitted us to a strong national defense. The truth is America can't lead in the world today because President Biden has done nothing but squander American credibility and erode American military readiness since the day he arrived in office. Hard truth. And let me just say, President Biden's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan was a disgrace. It dishonored the service and sacrifice and memory of those who defended our freedom in that war-torn land for so many years. With that said, let me be clear, confident that there are veterans here in this room and looking on. Nothing of that disastrous withdrawal will ever diminish the honor and gratitude the American people feel for all the men and women who fought and defended and sacrificed for our freedom in Afghanistan for 20 years. But you all gathered here know that only a strong America can lead. And that was why under our administration, we rebuilt our military. Three trillion dollars in defense spending, including 740 billion dollars in 2021 alone. Just as importantly, with some tough love with our allies around the world, we secured more than 400 billion dollars in increased spending for our common defense from our NATO allies and other allies around the world. But sadly, again, the Biden administration has squandered American strength and credibility while engaging in reckless and unnecessary spending at home, spending that lit the pilot light of the inflation that is savaging American family budgets. As Heritage Foundation's 2023 Index on U.S. Military Strength described this week authoritatively, under this administration, U.S. naval and air power are in decline. Pentagon budgets have been flatlined at a time when China continues to float more ships in its Navy virtually every week, continues to redouble its commitment to catch up to our technological advantage. I know it's not being talked about very much, but it's happening. You know, the uh, highest title I will ever hold is DAD. And when I speak about our military, I, it's a little personal. 
My uh, son, Michael, is a captain in the United States Marine Corps. And my son-in-law, Henry, is a lieutenant in the United States Navy. And we couldn't be more proud of them. And our daughter and our daughter-in-law are all of those who serve in the uniform of the United States. And let me say, men and women, they deserve better than the Biden administration is giving to our military and their families today. And so does America. You know, I've always said weakness arouses evil. But peace comes through strength. You know, I think it's important to note our administration was the only administration in the 21st century where Vladimir Putin did not attempt to redraw international lines by force. And it was no coincidence. The truth is, we not only made historic investments in our national defense, but we had a commander-in-chief who was willing to let our armed forces do their job. They took down the ISIS caliphate. They took out their leader without one American casualty. And the worst terrorist in the world, Qasem Soleimani, is gone. It was the credibility of the use of force, the willingness to use American force, and being prepared to use force that made the world a lot calmer place in our four years. But how times have changed. As Russia continues its unconscionable war of aggression to Ukraine, I believe the conservatives must make it clear that Putin must stop and Putin will pay. There can be no room in the conservative movement for apologists for Putin. There is only room in this movement for champions of freedom. Karen and I traveled to Ukraine early on. We found ourselves in Poland with a group called Samaritan's Purse. Had the opportunity to travel across the border in March. I saw sights that I never thought I'd see other than in a black and white film from the early part of the last century. Women of every age, children of every age, dragged along behind them. With every one of the earthly possessions that they could carry all in long lines, streaming out of the country. I believe as we stand here today, it's the arsenal of democracy. We must continue to provide Ukraine with the resources to defend themselves. We must continue to bring economic pressure of the most powerful economy in the world on Russia. And we must continue to provide the generosity, compassion, and prayers of the American people until Russia relents and until peace is restored. I want to be clear on this. John Quincy Adams said memorably, America must never go, quote, abroad in search of monsters to destroy. We never have. It's not who we are. But nevertheless, neither can we afford to ignore the rising tide of enemies of freedom around the world. A resurgent Russia, an increasingly aggressive Chinese Communist Party and military, Iran and North Korea. And we have to have a military fit to the task. This means, first and foremost, funding our military and providing our service members with the resources and training they need to accomplish their mission and come home safe and make up for the Biden deficit in defense spending that's underway in America today, however unreported. It also means ending the practice of filling the heads of our military personnel with politically correct nonsense and refocusing our military on the mission at hand. And finally, it also means continuing to marshal our allies, as we did in the Trump-Pence administration, to do their part for our common defense. Now, I know there is a rising chorus in our party, including some new voices to our movement, who would have us disengage with the wider world and abandon the traditional values at the heart of our movement. But appeasement has never worked. 
ever in history. And now more than ever, we need a conservative movement committed to America's role as leader of the free world and as a vanguard of American values. <laughs> finally, finally, as we prepare for that great debate here on the cusp of what I believe will be a historic victory for our movement, I also want to encourage all of you to continue to be a voice for what Heritage Foundation has always been a voice for. Continue to hold fast to the ideals of our founders and encourage the tens of millions of Americans that follow the work of this extraordinary flagship of this movement to do the same. Hold fast to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The truth is, conservatives should recognize that we're very likely the last line of defense on the Constitution of the United States. You know, for most of our history, both political parties were committed to the ideals of the American founding and to the principles of the Constitution. But I don't have to tell you that that's no longer the case. We live in a time when liberals routinely demean the American founding, and today the left seeks to rewrite our Constitution, erase the Second Amendment, cancel freedom of speech in the First Amendment, the freedom of religion, and redefine our basic liberties. That's why conservatives, I believe, in this moment should rededicate ourselves to defend the principles at the heart of the republic. Because if we don't, no one will. President George Washington said memorably, the Constitution is the guide I will never abandon. And so, too, should we say. You know, every office holder in America takes the same oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I took that oath in January of 2017 to become your vice president. My left hand on a family Bible and the Bible of our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. at a time when the radical left seeks to rewrite and reject the principles at the heart of our Constitution, the American people must know that conservatives will not simply pay lip service to keeping faith with the Constitution, but that we will always keep our oath. That we will keep our oath, as the Bible says, even when it hurts. We will stand for the Constitution. We will uphold its principles even when it would be politically expedient to do otherwise. Because if conservatives don't defend the Constitution, we won't just lose elections. We'll lose our country. So men and women of the Heritage Foundation, that's the freedom agenda. And no time like the present to think about the future. Because the future's coming fast. I have every confidence that uh, when 20 days have passed, will be in a new era in America, an era ripe with opportunity, and not just a political comeback, but an American comeback, an opportunity for the American people to advance the principles that they know will make us stronger and more secure and more prosperous, and will strengthen the foundation under the timeless values that have created the freest and most prosperous nation in the history of the world. I just want to encourage all of you here at Heritage to continue to do what you've always done. Continue to defend our heritage of freedom without apology. Continue to guide and direct this movement. As majorities arrive on Capitol Hill, they will look again, as we did in the past, to this place. And I encourage you to step up and lead. Give them the guidance to be able to steer a course back to a boundless American future. And I will thank you in advance because I know you will. Because I know Heritage Foundation. I've been around here for a while. And I got the gray hair to prove it. But I also have faith. 
You know, in my years as your vice president, my opinion of the American government occasionally went down and has done so in the last two years. But every single day of my public life, my opinion of the American people has gone up. This is a great people. I've seen the American people in good times and in bad. In the wake of natural disasters, I've stood with soldiers in far field places. I've stood with members of law enforcement. I've seen the selflessness of our health care workers. I can't help but think when I think of the American people of what King Solomon said when he was tasked with leadership. He was asked for what he would pray. And he said, give me a discerning heart to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. I love that prayer for two reasons. Number one, like millions of Americans throughout our generation, he, he knew whose he was. He knew to look up. But he also knew who he served. And I just want to say to Heritage Foundation, if we will simply renew our faith in him who has ever guided this extraordinary experiment in freedom for all these years, if we will simply continue to stand firm for that heritage of freedom and values that has made our nation great, and if we'll also understand and believe that this is a great nation, a good, compassionate, decent nation that will rally to our cause, I know the best days for freedom and for America are yet to come. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless America. Well, Mr. Vice President, thank you. Great. I had, you know, being an academic, about 20 questions for you. But we'll stick with three. Gee, look at the time. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> we'll cut straight to the chase. I was going to ask you how return to private life has gone, but it's, it's obvious it's going really well. So first question, you, you alluded. Well, we moved back to Indiana. So life got better right away. Got better right away. Five acres and a pond and a granddaughter which has been the biggest news in our family's life. Congratulations. You alluded to the fact that being in Washington and the American government's issues caused your hair to go gray. It did something else to my head. <laughs> and, and, and that's actually the point. And you, you were very kind in saying that Heritage is the, the flagship of the movement, which is generous. We, we've taken to using this new metaphor in addition to flagship, which is that we're the outpost in D.C., for the everyday American mm -hmm. at a time when, frankly, sir, too many elected officials forget why they come here. And so I want to pick up on one of the last comments you made where you alluded to the reality that a lot of Americans don't have faith in institutions. In addition to all the great policy you talked about, the great policy we work on at Heritage, scanning the room, policy that organizations represented here work on, how in the world do we restore in the heart of the everyday American faith in American institutions. Vote Republican. <laughs> you got to make this 501c3 friendly. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Conservative. Simply a personal opinion. Doesn't represent <laughs> the views of the organization. Perfect. Um, no, all, all kidding aside, I, I, um, I meant every word I said about Heritage Foundation. Thank you. And I, I, think, I, I think you are the voice for everyday Americans. If everyday Americans are defined as people that believe in freedom, people that believe in family and in faith and in traditional values and in America's place in the world. Um, and you've been that all along the way. I think our challenge is simply to have government as good as our people. Because I, I, I can honestly tell you that this is a, th this is a great nation. And, and as I said at the close of my remarks, I... I've seen the compassion, the generosity, the courage of Americans 
day in and day out when I served as vice president. And, and I'm absolutely convinced if we, will, if we will support leadership that reflects their, their commitment to our ideals, their goodness, uh, their neighborliness, as well as their fierce belief in freedom, the American people will rally to our cause. I said yesterday I was in uh, uh, I was down in South Carolina at uh, Walford College and I said our, our politics are probably more divided today than ever before, but I'm not sure the American people are as divided as our politics. And it, that may sound a little contradictory to some, but I. Sometimes I like to tell people, once you get 15 miles out of Washington, D.C., people in this country actually get along pretty well. <laughs> you know, we figure it out, right? We're at businesses and families and communities. I mean, we've got failed leadership in some of our cities. We have failed leadership at the national level. But the American people each and every day find a way to get up and make it happen. And I just, I really do believe that's the objective, Kevin. Thank you. Is that we is that we have government as good as our people. And you all need to know, particularly the people that support the Heritage Foundation, and that's in the tens of millions around America today. In my experience, there is no organization that played a greater role in the last 22 years holding the Republican Party's feet to the fire of conservative ideals than the Heritage Foundation. And I want to thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege. And, and I have to say, we're looking forward to doing that in January of next year, because it's not enough, as, as you, I know you agree, because we've talked about this a lot over the last several months, it's not enough to win elections. We have to come in as conservatives anytime we're in positions of power and govern like conservatives. And so this is an advice question, and I'm just going to put you in what I hope isn't just a hypothetical, but something that really happens that there's a conservative majority in the House and Senate, they come to one of the leaders of our movement, that would be you, and they say, Mr. Vice President, what advice do you give us for the first 100 days of conservative governance in the House and Senate to start taking this country back? What are the two or three things you say they should focus on? Flood the zone. Flood the zone. I mean, first and foremost, let's get this economy back on its feet. Let's reverse some of this reckless, irresponsible spending by the Biden administration that's been driving inflation. And let's let's use the power of the purse to demand that they secure the border of the United States of America and do that out of the gate. We know what their agenda is. I mean, I, I was, you know, I, I was not surprised, but I was struck by uh, President Biden's statement yesterday that his number one priority, if Democrats win the House and the Senate, would be to codify Roe versus Wade. It's not surprising. I think they're literally grasping for anything at this point in the midterm elections. We ought to make the American people's priorities our priorities. Uh, and we ought to do everything in, in the power that the Congress will have uh, to get the economy back on track, to unleash American energy, uh, and to secure our border, and, and then, then everything else in the agenda. Uh, obviously, you'll run into the, you know, the, the opposition of a Democrat administration. But I think the American people are going to be looking to, looking to uh, Republicans in these new majorities, and they're going to be looking for results, not posturing, not just going on television shows and saying what's wrong with the other side, but saying here's what we're for, here's what we're passing, put it on the president's desk, make him veto it, and two years from now we'll have a national debate on whether or not the American people want that vision for America's future or theirs. Well said. So let's go two years beyond that, and this will, this will be the final question because I know you have a busy schedule, and thank you again for being here. It's 2026. We're celebrating our 250th anniversary. Mm. And here at Heritage, because we have the luxury and the privilege of being a policy shop, when we're thinking about policy change, we go out 5, 10, 50 years and say, what is it? What's the ideal, like the 100% ideal? of the policy solution, we all know in this room, I would presume, it's self-governance. But in order to get there, how, what are the steps we're going to take? But the point about 2026 is that's one of those inflection points where the country, as it should, will be going through some introspection. Presumably, there will be a new president, speaking as a conservative, not a member of a party. I surely hope there is a more conservative president. 
This isn't a question about you, by the way, because I can't ask that question inside the Heritage Foundation. It's a question about what will we have accomplished between today and July 4th, 2026, that should give young Americans hope that the next 250 years will be dominated by the United States of America. Ronald Reagan said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It has to be fought for. It doesn't come in the bloodstream. It has to be taught. And I, I, I truly do believe that we're, we're in a moment, we're in an inflection point in the life of this nation. The American people have now seen the secular socialist welfare state that the Democrats have been talking about for decades. I mean, if there's any silver lining in the disastrous record of the Biden administration, of Pelosi and Schumer, it's that and the American people see where they want to take us. And I, I truly do believe that that's, that's not a future of freedom. And so I, I truly do believe that in 20 days from now, let's win a victory for freedom. Two years from then, let's win another victory for freedom. And when we get to 2026, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a student of the American founding. I, I never taught Dr. Roberts. I never. But you get an A plus, sir. I mean, you're doing great. I don't remember any A pluses. Uh, <laughs> but I, I took a degree in American history. I love the American founding. I mean, what a great opportunity for us. In the years leading up to our 250th anniversary of the birth of our freedom, for us to say that in our time, we defended freedom. In our time, we reinvigorated and renewed America's commitment to the ideals of our founders. And, and then, and then two, 250 can be a celebration of that. I mean, that's the... That's not the legacy. That's that's uh, the inheritance that we need to pass along. It's an inheritance of, of liberty, and limited government, and life. And I believe if all of us do all we need to do, we will not only win a victory for freedom, but but come that historic day, we'll be celebrating that fic that that freedom reigns in America, and it will have been conservative Americans, everyday Americans, who delivered that victory for freedom. So help us God. Thank you all very much. This was great. It was great. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. There are, uh, Mr. Vice President, there's still a lot of grateful Americans out there for you, and, and I'm going to come back to that in 30 seconds, but let me say that once we wrap, because you, you won't be able to, to hear my logistical comment over the applause, which should happen, please give the Vice President a couple minutes to exit the room so you move on to the next stop while you remain in your seats. He doesn't care about that, but we at Heritage do. But let me say this. I'm just going to play historian for a minute. You and I talk often about leadership when we, we visit. And history, not just of this country, but I see some friends from around the world, leadership and statesmen, statesmen in other countries know the cultural inheritance they are born with. And I just want to say, as a historical comment, obviously not a political one, you're one of the statesmen of our age. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for exiting left. Thank you all. Have a great day.